Hi. So the fourth theme of the course uh, focuses on statistical inferences. And uh, we will start from the notion of confidence interval. So uh, statistical inference in general refers to this uh, drawing uh, probabilistic inferences uh, based on the sample regarding the underlying population, which we already discussed earlier in the context of uh, properties of the estimators. So uh, there's two types of uh, statistical inference that um, are useful to distinguish. One is the so-called uh, estimation, and another is uh, hypothesis testing. Uh, the difference is uh, that in estimation, we are interested in uh, estimating the, the underlying uh, parameter of interest, for example, this uh, slope coefficient uh, beta 2 in the, in the linear regression model. Uh, in the hypothesis testing, the, the setting is slightly different. So there, we already have some kind of uh, prior statement about what the, what the true parameter value would be. And based on the data, then we want to assess how, how likely it is that this uh, underlying uh, or, or this prior hypothesis is true or false. So in estimation, we do not have any kind of prior, prior hypothesis about the parameter value. We just want to estimate this value. And estimation falls to two, two categories. One is the point estimation that we have considered before. So there we just give some, some specific, specific sharp value, some given number as, an, as our estimate. Whereas in interval estimation, then the purpose is that we, we, we state some interval that, uh, that uh, our parameter of interest should fall into. And so to pave the way towards hypothesis testing, I'll discuss now the, the interval estimation in this, uh, this lesson. And I will also show later that how this confidence interval can be actually also utilized in the, in the context of hypothesis testing. But I assume that the confidence interval is, is uh, something that is relatively familiar with. So briefly, just, uh, uh, just to, to uh, indicate here in the context of the uh, empirical example that we have considered. So this is again, this uh, regression results of the hedonic model of housing market. Uh, this is the Excel output, but in many statistical software also they, they produce uh, directly this, uh, uh, also the confidence intervals. So in Excel, it is indicated as, uh, as lower 95% and upper 95%. So you can see that in, the, in this uh, linear regression, then we get confidence intervals for all of the parameters, including the, uh, the intercept or the constant term and all of these um, explanatory variables, the coefficients of explanatory variables. So in some sense, you can think about this confidence interval. Uh, so the confidence interval is this range between this, uh, this lower 95% and upper 95%. So consider, for example, the, the variable, the size in square meters that we have considered so the confidence interval, you can read it from this table indicated with red color. So the confidence interval is, is uh, um, between 5,259 and uh, 8,686. So uh, the confidence interval is very useful to indicate this uh, uncertainty about this, uh, this uh, parameter estimate. In some sense, it's similar to the standard error so that it indicates that how much uncertainty is in this our, our estimates. So I believe that you have uh, encountered this uh, definition of the, of the confidence interval already before, perhaps already in secondary school or, or some uh, introductory statistics courses. So let me just remind you, and, and also, also I have here phrased it in terms of this um, uh, parameter beta. So, so I think about this parameter beta that it could be one of the slope coefficients or the intercept coefficient of the regression model. But I don't include now any subscript because I don't want to make a statement which specific uh, parameter it might be. So two important concepts in the confidence interval is this uh, confidence level and significance level. So confidence level is one minus the significance level. So usually the significance alpha is specified as something small. Typically it's 5% uh, or even 1%. So therefore then the confidence level 
would be one minus alpha. So it would be then 95% or even 99%. So for example, the standard Excel output includes 95% confidence intervals. So in that case, then the significance level alpha is, is 5%. And what's the, what is this interpretation of this uh, confidence or significance? So the confidence interval is uh, constructed so that we, we determine these endpoints. So this was this lower 95 and higher, upper 95 in this Excel table. These are these endpoints which I have indicated with the B subscript L and B subscript U. And I have also indicated here for, for clarity that uh, both these endpoints depend on our data X. Okay, so those are calculated based on our, our data. Of course, also dependent variable Y influences that, but it's just to indicate that th those endpoints uh, depend on data. And those, those endpoints BL and BU are determined so that uh, the uh, probability that uh, this uh, BL is less than the true parameter beta uh, and that, uh, that BU is greater than uh, true parameter beta would be equal to one minus significance level alpha. So there is clearly a connection to the, to the probability theory. And however, here it's important to emphasize that, uh, that uh, what, what we actually calculate or what we need to estimate when we do, do interval estimation, we estimate these endpoints of the interval. So BL and BU are what we calculate. And here it's important to emphasize that we still think that this true parameter beta is just a constant. So there is not any, any uncertain, there's not any randomness concerning beta. Beta is just what it is. Our uncertainty is, is mainly that we do not observe it directly, but uh, the random variables here are those, uh, those endpoints BL and BU. And they have certain, certain probability distributions and this leads to this kind of probabilistic statement so this probabilistic statement refers to this random variables bl and bu whereas uh, beta itself is just a constant so this is also something that uh, that sometimes uh, uh, causes some confusion in the interpretation so on this slide i have uh, i have stated the so-called frequentist interpretation so here we think that, okay, if we, if we do this kind of repeated sampling, so we always uh, uh, draw some random samples from the population multiple times. And for each, uh, each random sample, we then estimate the confidence interval. So the idea in the frequentist interpretation is that, uh, that uh, of course, we would notice that this, uh, these confidence intervals differ across different random samples, but uh, the this uh, true parameter beta would be contained within this confidence interval in 95% uh, uh, of the of of these uh, frequentist samples or in general 1 minus alpha percent of this uh, these samples so the frequentist uh, interpretation doesn't uh, allow making this kind of uh, uh, interpretation that uh, that uh, probability of beta falling to this interval is equal to 95% or 1 minus alpha percent in general. So this would be completely against the frequentist interpretation because as I mentioned before, um, beta itself is not a random variable. So therefore we cannot, cannot make this kind of uh, interpretation that the probability of beta falling to this interval is something. So this is some, why we need to be very careful with the, with the interpretation of the confidence interval. I believe that in many, many, uh, many sources you might find many papers, many studies. Also, the confidence interval is uh, is uh, sort of naively interpreted, uh, at least from the frequentist perspective. There is also the so-called Bayesian interpretation of the of the confidence interval, where you can actually make some kind of uh, interpretation about uh, about beta. But uh, this is more gets more to the sort of philosophical questions that uh, that uh, fall beyond the scope of the course of of scope of the present course. So uh, this is just to remind you that, uh, that uh, we have to be very cautious about the interpretation and all the uncertainty actually concerns this uh, endpoints, BL and BU. Those are the random variables that we calculate based on our observed data, where does this, uh, this true parameter beta is just a constant. Okay.
So next, I will I will um, walk through walk you through or remind you how how we actually can calculate the the confidence interval based on observed sample. So typically, of course, the in in the in the regression analysis, uh, you don't need to calculate the confidence intervals yourself. Uh, your, your statistical software will do it. Um, if you are thoroughly familiar, thoroughly familiar with the, how, the, how the confidence interval is, is derived and calculated, then, then uh, you may skip to the, to the next lesson. But uh, in the following part of this, this present lesson, then I will, I will formally show you how to derive this, uh, this uh, confidence interval for the slope. So this clarifies how, how actually, for example, Excel or whatever statistical software you may be using, uh, how this confidence interval is actually calculated. And uh, to this end, I wanted to remind you this, this, uh, this is just copied from the, from the previous theme. I, I introduced you the notion of asymptotic normality. And uh, I refer to that if you have a large enough sample size, then, uh, then uh, this uh, our parameter estimate for this uh, slope coefficient uh, converges in distribution to the to the normal distribution, and uh, we know that its expected value is uh, beta two, and there's no known variance also. So uh, therefore, we can then utilize the 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 normal distribution for deriving the confidence interval assuming that we have large enough sample size. So in order to utilize then the, the normal distribution, uh, the usual approach is to then utilize so-called standardized uh, or standard normal distribution, uh, which is indicated by this uh, capital N and, uh, and as argument zero and one. So this means that, uh, that this uh, standard normal distribution has mean zero and the variance of one and conveniently also the standard deviation is equal to one. So in order to utilize the standard normal distribution, then uh, we can do so-called standardization. And this is simple. Uh, we just take our random variable here, here this B2. Uh, we subtract the, the uh, expected value, which was uh, beta two. So then the expected value of the difference B2 minus beta two is equal to zero. And then when we, when we divide by the standard deviation, which is here this uh, sigma subscript B2, then uh, if we divide this difference by the standard deviation, then uh, this uh, standardized variable B2 minus beta 2, and uh, this difference divided by sigma B2, then the standardized variable follows the normal distribution with mean zero and, and uh, variance of one. So then we can then utilize the known properties of the standard normal distribution. So this would be this kind of typical bell-shaped uh, curve that you have certainly encountered before in many, many contexts. So for the standard normal distribution, there exist, uh, for example, statistical tables. You can also calculate this, uh, this uh, critical points uh, using, for example, Excel. So we we also then uh, then you can use this so-called cumulative uh, distribution function and normally this uh, uh, cumulative distribution function for the for the standard normal distribution is denoted by this capital phi so it's this greek letter phi as you can see in this this uh, this lesson and in some sense we need to use the inverse inverse of the cumulative distribution function so so uh, we can find that for example um uh, uh, at the at the value of this uh, cumulative distribution function at point one point ninety six is equal to zero point nine seven five. So that means that uh, two point five percent of the of the probability mass is is greater than one point ninety six. So if we start from this uh, this uh, this point zero point nine seven five. Uh, when we want to derive, for example, 95% confidence interval, and we want to leave two and a half percent of the of the probability mass to the to the right tail of the of the distribution, then the inverse of the cumulative distribution function tells us that, that it's it's 1.96. Okay, 
I assume that you are you are already quite familiar with the standard normal distribution, and uh, and if not, then there's of course plenty of uh, sources that you can you can capture. But I believe this is something familiar to you. So then, given those kind of uh, kind of uh, critical points of the of the standard normal distribution, then I have uh, here utilized this kind of probability expressions to derive the confidence interval. So uh, we know then uh, if, already by the definition of the of the cumulative distribution function, uh, we can then plug into this kind of probability expression that the probability that is our standardized variable is less than or equal to minus 1.96 is equal to 0 0.025. So here I have used the properties of the standard normal distribution and this critical point minus 1.96. And also, also you probably remember that, uh, that, uh, that uh, normal distribution is symmetric. So also we know that probability that the standardized uh, variable is less than or equal to 1.96 is equal to 0 0.975. So this gives us this kind of uh, probability expression that, uh, that the standardized variable falls between minus 1.96 and plus 1.96 with a probability of uh, 95%. Okay. So then to derive the confidence interval, then this is the this is the the um, expression. So now we have already effectively derived the confidence interval for the standardized variable. But actually, we are not interested in a confidence interval of the standardized variable, but we are actually deriving confidence interval for the beta parameter. And we will do that next. So this will be just um, simply reorganizing these uh, inequalities within this uh, probability operator. Okay, I think I don't go through all of the steps in detail, but uh, but if you if you, for example, print the slide and uh, and uh, take a pen and you can you can go through these intermediate steps. I just need to need to move uh, some of this uh, or reorganize this inequality. So in the first step, I have just uh, uh, multiplied both inequalities and multiplied both uh, uh, both uh, with this um, sigma uh, sigma subscript B2, which is the standard deviation. And then uh, second step, uh, notice that when, when I when I will uh, move this uh, b2 on the other side then there's this uh, minus beta 2 so multiplying by minus 2 sorry minus 1 uh, changes the sign of the inequality so i have taken that also into account so if you want to want to go through this uh, this uh, reorganization uh, it's good to perhaps uh, take uh, take one inequality at a time and and uh, go through but you can easily verify that this uh, this um, uh, these inequalities then form to this kind of uh, structure where we have probability that uh, b2 minus 1.96 times uh, sigma b2 is less than or equal to beta 2 and less than or equal to b2 plus 1.96 plus 1 times sigma b2 and this probability is uh, equal to 0 0.95. So now we essentially have uh, the 95% confidence interval for this uh, uh, slope coefficient beta 2. And perhaps a more convenient way to express this confidence interval is to, is to just uh, take this uh, B2 plus minus uh, this critical point 1.96 multiplied by the, by the standard deviation sigma B2. So, so that's the usual, usual kind of uh, way that we can also express the confidence interval and for example, if you remember the regression output, the, the lower bound, this BU, is, is B2 minus, uh, and then, then this, uh, this uh, upper bound is B2 plus 1.96 plus 1 times sigma B2. Okay, so I believe that so far this is something that is thoroughly familiar to you already from perhaps from the secondary school. But there is actually one more thing that we need to take into account. So to calculate the confidence interval, we can take our OLS estimate B2, that's the point estimate we have, 
we can take that as a starting point and then we construct a confidence interval around it but um, there's another another thing that we also need to we have this uh, critical value from the standard normal distribution but we also need to have this uh, this uh, standard deviation sigma b2 but unfortunately this is not something that we that we uh, know from theory or can directly observe actually this uh, standard deviation sigma b2 also needs to be estimated okay so the sigma b2 is also also uh, unknown and uh, if it turns out if you have very very large sample size then we can actually harmlessly use the standard error which is the estimated standard deviation so we can we can replace this sigma b2 by standard error of b2 that's our estimate but um, if you have a relatively small sample size then then uh, we need to take into account that we also estimate this uh, this uh, standard deviation sigma b2 so there's also possibility of estimation e error in the standard error itself so this is the reason why in the confidence interval and typically in the in the, in the statistical inferences uh, we don't actually utilize the the standard normal distribution but rather uh, utilize the so-called student's t distribution so uh, we can think about this t distribution as a as a something as a variant of this of this uh, normal distribution and in this slide i already kind of implicitly implied that uh, as the sample size approaches to infinity then the t distribution also approaches to the standard normal distribution but in the finite sample it's not the not the case so the idea of using the t distribution for the confidence interval or taking the critical value not from the standard normal distribution but from the t distribution is to also reflect the uncertainty about this estimated standard deviation because we we replace this theoretical sigma b2 by the by the standard error that we have uh, calculated from our data okay so here on this slide you can see that we replace this kind of theoretical sigma by standard error but as a result we also need to replace this uh, critical value of the standard normal distribution by the critical value of the t distribution so uh, it's possible that you already know the t distribution or 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 perhaps not so so let me briefly just illustrate you how the t distribution would look like so the t distribution is also this kind of bell-shaped distribution like uh, like the uh, like, like this gaussian normal distribution however this um the shape of the the t distribution uh depends on the so-called degrees of freedom so we will encounter this notion of degrees of freedom in the in the course uh, over and over again i think i have already mentioned it before so degrees of freedom depend on the sample size but it also takes into account that how many parameter we have in the model so for the order and least squares estimator in linear regression the degrees of freedom are n minus capital k so n is the sample size and capital k is the number of uh, parameters in the in the model so it, this also includes the constant term or the intercept term so in other words how many betas there are in the in the model so uh, as as i mentioned already before as the sample size n increases and eventually approaches to infinity then this t distribution converges to the standard normal distribution however when the when the sample size is uh, is smaller then notice that this t distribution has uh, has uh, according to the to the diagram here the the t distribution has somewhat fatter tails so so this is particularly important for taking into account this uh, uncertainty about the the standard standard deviation of the of the estimate so the critical values of the t distribution we can we can read them from for example there exists this kind of uh, statistical table similar to the standard normal distributions there exist also statistical tables for the t distribution um normally i myself i don't really use the statistical tables because nowadays it's more convenient to if i need a critical value of the t distribution i can use for example the excel function so there's in excel this function 
t inv and uh, there we need to give this uh, for this um, the, it has two arguments so t inv it requires the uh, probability so there we need to insert the significance level so if we have for example 5% significance level then we insert the 5% and then then we need to include include the degrees of freedom so that would be the n minus k and on this slide i have illustrated that how this how this critical value uh, changes depending on the sample size so i assume now that this is just a single single linear regression we have two betas beta 1 and beta 2 so degrees of freedom then only depend on the sample size so degrees of freedom would be n minus 2 and i have here this kind of uh, small table where the left column includes a sample size n uh, increasing from 20 to 50 and all the way to 5000 and then on the on the right uh, column i have the critical value of the of the t distribution so those have been calculated with this t in function you can check uh, if you're interested that uh, that you get the same same critical values you can also compare it to the statistical tables if you like so I have here calculated this critical value of the t distribution notice that uh, for the sample size of uh, 20 observations the the critical value is 2.1 but then as the sample size increases then uh, then the critical value uh, decreases and uh, when we have a sample size of 5000 then we are already effectively uh, having the same critical value as the standard normal distribution would suggest so like I mentioned before that if the if the sample size is large enough we can just use the critical value of the of the standard normal distribution there's no difference whatsoever to the to the critical values of the t distribution but if you have relatively small samples say 50 observations or 100 observations then the use of the t distribution uh, makes this kind of uh, correction that uh, that uh, that uh, uh, it corrects for the for the potential estimation error that might be involved in this uh, standard error rather than the true sigma parameter that we don't really directly observe. So I hope this clarifies that uh, why in the confidence interval we we use this uh, this uh, t distribution rather than uh, the standard normal distribution. Anyway, uh, the confidence interval is 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 built around this uh, this uh, point estimate b two. So notice that uh, that always the point estimate B2 is always exactly in the middle of the confidence interval. And then this interval is then plus minus depending on the standard error. Um, one more point that, which may be, may be useful. So if you don't have these uh, this, uh, statistical tables at hand or you don't have Excel available, so if you look at this table of the of the critical values of the t distribution in the single regression then then as a, as a, some kind of rule of thumb uh, if you don't have any any anything else available then this uh, critical value of t is approximately equal to 2 so if if you if you replace this critical value by just 2 then you are not very far off if we, if we do the 95% confidence interval so I want to just uh, just uh, come back to still to this uh, Excel example or the, this this uh, regression output of the hedonic model. So think about, for example, this uh, um, regression size in square meters. So firstly, if we look at the results, notice that uh, the point estimate, so point estimate of the coefficient is this 6,972 and uh, you can verify that this 6,972 falls exactly between this confidence interval. So it's exactly between this 5,258 and 6, 000, sorry, 8,686. Another point is that uh, if we make this kind of uh, rough approximation, so if we take uh, two times standard error, standard error is this 857, so two times would be roughly 1,700, so you can also verify that if you if you take plus minus 1700 to this point estimate you come relatively close to the confidence interval already okay 
So if you don't have the confidence interval, if somebody is just reporting to you the coefficients and standard errors, then uh, very rough proxy would be just to take two times the uh, standard error plus plus minus. Then you then you can get the at least in the ballpark estimate of the of the confidence interval. And that's in the case that you don't have this exact uh, critical value of the t distribution available. And if the sample size is very large, if it is thousands of observations, you can harmlessly replace this critical value of the t distribution by the standard normal distribution. There's no difference whatsoever in that case. Okay, so uh, as the next topic, then I will discuss the hypothesis testing and I will start with the classic uh, t-test. Thanks for your attention.